We've lived our entire lives in East LA. There are gangs here. Yeah, we're not afraid of the gangs in the streets. We're more on the lookout for the gangs with the badges. Now to an eyewitness news investigation. An alleged gang of sheriff's deputies within the LA County Sheriff's Department known as the Executioners. Their alleged tattoo depicts a skeleton in flames, an AK-47, and a Nazi-style helmet. Miriam Hernandez has a closer look at the pressure mounting on the department to open their files on any groups like this. Right. What you want to do? I mean, but, but you were out there like, you know, there's, there's different levels to that shit. When you're in the neighborhood and you're really outside every day. Yeah, I was outside every day. That's Jay and E liquor. Right. Oh, my homie got killed that right in front of me. Really? What was that like? What, what age? I was grown. I was like 20. I was like 20. He just turned 25, like four hours after his birthday. Right. Oh. We was normal day, me and my homie Junebug, we post in front of the store every day. Every day, smoke, hustle, whatever, this is the spot. And, you got a um, lot of YouTube videos talking about being outside this store. Yeah, I used to, the store was my life. Mm. It was every fucking day, it was like a job. And um, shit, uh, he had went to jail, he had went to prison, he had got out, he was doing good. And then uh, he started back trying to pimp. And um, he started being on fig again every day. And uh, I don't know, he was just right there one day after his birthday, me and my homie smoking. He walked up from across the street. He said, what's up? We started chilling. Then he said, I'm gonna go get some weed from around the corner. When he came back from getting the weed, one of my homies seen a car and he like, hey, watch that. That looked like Hartman. That's a detective. Mm, shout used out to, Draco the Ruler. He used to be a police, but he turned detective. So mm. we was on his ass. That's was, the one who was on Draco's ass, making his life a little yeah, hell for a while. Yeah. He was, that's how he became detective mm. because he was, he was he was forcing shit like he was on shit and um he had a Buick well, so whatever we seen the Buick and we like just watch it feel me and um next thing we know the car doubled back and I'm like man it's the police what are we gonna do and um the motherfucker turned on 79th like it turned on the corner and the liquor store is like right here and uh that motherfucker parked two people got out but before we knew that they got out and was walking up it was like too late it was like it was right here. We was right here, and um, shit, they just got to shooting. The cops? Mm -mm, mm mm Oh. We thought it was the cops in the car. Oh. It wasn't a marked car. It was a Buick Regal. Like, it was a it was a regular car. But the police ride around in these type yeah. of cars so they could throw you off. You mm. feel me? But, nah, it wasn't the police. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then they probably shot, like, 70 times. Fuck. And he got hit once. Damn. And killed him. And, and what what'd you do? I ran, I was the one banged out. Robert Hansen Shelby, also known as Milk74, was born on September 1st, 1993, and he was 20 years old on the day that this tragic shooting took place. Now, I have never claimed to be a mathematician, but according to my calculations, this would mean that it was most likely around the year 2013. According to Milk, he was with his homie Hank, who had just turned 25 years old only four hours before being gunned down in front of the J&E liquor store on Figaro Street in Los Angeles, California. Tank had just got back from copping weed when a suspicious Buick Regal began to creep past the liquor store. Milk assumed that it was an unmarked detective vehicle, but without warning the car came to a stop and the two assailants got out and began to approach Milk and Tank. The two assailants then fired 70 shots at the liquor store, one of those shots being the bullet that would claim the life of Tank. Despite being a known hoover, Milk did not have that thang on him, so with not much of a choice and only having mere seconds to make a decision, Milk would make a run for it and began to hop fences as the armed men began to approach the liquor store with their eyes locked on Tank. No did it. Milk recalls hearing about 70 shots as he was scaling the fences to safety. And when the storm of bullets finally settled and the coast was clear, he made his way back towards the scene of the crime to find Tank standing in the street who appeared to be unharmed by the hail of bullets that just rained down upon the liquor store. But Milk would only have a moment before his relief quickly turned to a deepened devastation when Tank fell to the ground with a single bullet wound that pierced his lung and he would be pronounced dead upon arrival. One can only imagine the level of pain Milk must have felt in this moment. And to make matters worse, Tank's people would blame Milk for his passing. And I am sure that Milk carries a burden of guilt towards himself as well. But with no strap, what was he to do? In a situation like that, the only logical move to make would be to save yourself. Milk doesn't believe that this was related to a rival gang who was seeking some get back. No, instead he believes that this was a hit orchestrated by the LAPD. 
because they had been consistently trying to remove his crew from posting up in front of the liquor store. The police working with them to get on us because they want us from in front of that store so bad. And at first glance, this fantastical theory may seem like a reach, but that's until you understand that the LAPD has been corrupted with internal racist gangs for over five decades. Deputies refused to speak. That's an example of a code of silence that is enforced from above he says that Sheriff Villanueva has promoted a culture of intimidation that extends to oversight officials like him. See that? That sweeps for bugs because I get informants telling me that he's uh, bugging my emails. He has a team, a politically charged investigation team, and the way they work is the sheriff announces the target, he tells the public the person's a criminal, and then that team goes and tries to make it uh, stick in court. So maybe Milk survived not solely based on his fence-hopping capabilities, but possibly because he wasn't the target. Maybe his skin color played a role into who those bullets were actually sent for. Because when we peel back the deceptive layers of the LAPD, we will begin to notice a systemic web of gang activity that has been nothing short of a plague on the city of Los Angeles for decades. It's a social function. People band together. Unit pride. He says the issue is overblown. In the absence of good supervision, yes, it could be harmful. But other groups that have tattoos, in fact, all of them engage in charitable activities. From the wayside whiteys to the executioners, there are 18 confirmed gangs existing within the department. And much like street gangs, they have initiation rituals that include taking the lives of innocent victims throughout the community of Los Angeles. Uh, conservatively, I estimate I read about 100,000 pages of legal filings. And what I came away with was a 15 part series detailing 18 gangs that I was able to confirm the existence of within the department. There are the Little Devils, Posse, the Wayside Whiteys, the 2000 Boys, the 3000 Boys, the Jump Out Boys, the Banditos, the Executioners, the Spartans, the Cowboys, the Rattlesnakes, and the Tasmanian Devils. They have killed 19 people, all of whom were men of color, several of whom were in a mental health crisis when they were killed. Uh, the government from the county level, the state level, and the federal level has known about this issue since the early 1990s and no significant action policy change has been brought forth. Who do you call when you are a minority and the people who are supposed to protect you are actually the ones who are preying on you? Where do you go to feel safe when the leaders of your community are quite literally trying to kill you? And who can you trust when the law means absolutely nothing inside of your community? When the system has failed you in every imaginable way possible? For the mothers who have lost their children due to police gang initiation rituals, and then they are told that it was because their child was evil and deserved to be taken out back and put down like a rabbit dog. When systemic racism has consistently hindered your ability to raise a family and pass down your seed. This has been the reality for many residents in Los Angeles since the 1970s. And only until very recently has there been any type of push towards making some kind of a change. So let's do a quick run through of the gangs of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. All of them have stuff in common. You usually have official gang tattoos, a hand signal, and a way to join, usually by shooting or killing a civilian or doing something like falsifying paperwork. These are just a few of the gangs operating within the LA Sheriff's Department. The Wayside Whiteys. The Wayside Whiteys was a gang of white deputies at the Pitches Detention Center in northern LA County in the 1980s and 1990s. Their sign was having their middle fingers crossed to create a W for white. The Linwood Vikings. The Vikings were a gang based out of the Linwood Station. Their tattoo was of a Viking, and their hand sign was an L made with the thumb and index finger for Linwood and they were one of the most powerful and most violent gangs. A lot of their members became leaders in the department. The 3000 Boys. The 3000 Boys were based out of the Men's Central Jail in downtown LA. The 3000 Boys are particularly violent because that's where the department would transfer deputies convicted of crimes to keep them away from the public. The Jump Out Boys. The Jump Out Boys operated across the county in the Operation Safe Streets unit their tattoo was of a skeleton with glowing red eyes holding a revolver and the dead man's hand, a popular poker holding among law enforcement officers. They kept their manifesto in a notebook. The Regulators 
Out of the Century Station, you have the Regulators, who allegedly have many members working in department leadership. The Executioners. At the Compton Station, you have the Executioners. Their tattoo is of a skeleton with a Nazi helmet holding an assault rifle. Black people and women are not allowed to join the gang. The Banditos. The Banditos operate mainly out of the East LA Station, and their tattoo is of a skeleton wearing a sombrero with a smoking revolver and a sheriff's badge. They have a culture of working backwards, arresting or shooting civilians, and coming up with probable cause later by planting and manufacturing evidence. There are others, like the Rattlesnakes, the Pirates, and the Buffalo Soldiers that we know a lot less about. I say where? Show me. Oh yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So why do you think they're saying it? I have no idea. With this context, let's now journey back to the year 1991, when a man named Rodney King was videotaped being attacked by several Los Angeles police officers, which incited a riot when on April 29, 1992, those very same officers were found not guilty by an all-white jury. Due to the YouTube policies, I cannot show you the footage of Rodney King being attacked without this video being suppressed in the algorithm. But if you are interested in more context, then I encourage you to do a quick Google search of this footage. And you will notice that the video looks exactly like a gang attack. So the fact that it played out as anything other than that in court is sickening to say the least. This evidence will show that whatever Rodney King was, or whatever he did, it did not justify what you, was, what you saw on that videotape. The four defendants tried together, each had their own attorney with their own defense strategy. There's only one person that's in charge of the situation and that's Rodney Glenn King. You see him at the very beginning of that tape rise up, not slowly, not lumbering, but very quickly rise up, turn and charge Officer Powell. Tim Wynn <laughs> dealt with the situation as it then unfolded in accordance with his training and with his experience. He sees a number of things. He sees Wynn winding up like this. He knows Powell is behind his back. He believes, his perception is, that they're out of control. Of the four officers on trial, Lawrence Powell was by far the most aggressive on the video. Two of the other officers, Timothy Wind and Theodore Brizano, actually blamed Powell as part of their defense. Sergeant Stacy Kuhn, who was in charge the night of the beating, blamed Rodney King, and he took the stand. This was a managed and controlled use of force. It followed the policies and procedures of the Los Angeles Police Department and the training. In closing arguments, Prosecutor Terry White went after Kuhn and Powell in dramatic fashion. This is the man, and look at him. This man laughed. This man saw him. All right, Mr. Um, White, get back to the podium, please, and confine your uh, argument to the podium. I'm sorry, Your Honor. As the officers said, they were just following their training and the policies and procedures of the Los Angeles Police Department. Perhaps that is the problem. They are training officers to destroy non-white communities and have been doing so for over five decades. What's crazy is that this is what caused the riots in 1992, which further destroyed those communities. But yet here we are, 33 years later, and the LAPD is still infested with systemic police gangs. The videotape was self-explanatory. I mean, I mean that, that was just, that was just self-explanatory. There's nothing more you can say. I was sitting at home watching TV. My baby was asleep. I was watching HBO or whatever it was. And all of a sudden I flipped the channel and here's a non-guilty, non-guilty. I started crying. I mean, that really, that hurt because it was like, it happened to me. I could have been his sister. You know, what we have here, we have city leaders, Daryl Gates included, but the council members too, Mark Ridley Thomas, Michael, calling for everyone to be calm. How does that strike you? You don't I, want I, to... I think it's pretentious. It sounds like reverse psychology. And it's um, they can sit in their comfortable places in their in their status quo and their bourgeoisie and call for us to not be violent. We are not we have grown since the 1960s. We are not about to wreak havoc on our own community. We are not about to be contained and 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 imprisoned in 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 a in a in a in cage environment and burned down our own houses. We are not going to do that. We are going to march through Los Angeles. We are going to take it to the civic center. You do you think this is going into the night? Is that your intention? I'm not leaving. Now let us speed up the clocks to 8/12/2018 when an innocent young man was executed by the East County Los Angeles Police Department. 
that morning, he had actually led a prayer circle for another individual that had passed away. And they were having a barbecue to honor this person's life. That was the reason that he was there. On August 12, 2018, a woman called 911 to say that her boyfriend's watch had been stolen at gunpoint. After Los Angeles County Sheriff's deputies arrived, they eventually came across 21-year-old Anthony Vargas. When he saw the sheriff's car, Anthony ran, but he tripped and fell. The deputies chased him down, and they say a fight ensued. They claimed Anthony had a gun and shot him 13 times. Ten times in the back, once in the arm, and twice in the head. I got the call. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning. We all got there. We kept asking the sheriff, can you tell us if this is him? We stood there from 3 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. When they let me go and identify him, I was only able to see maybe a little bit lower than his eyebrow to his chin. And it was like just this little tiny piece. And once I seen that, I screamed and I fell to the floor. The officers responsible for this tragic shooting were never held accountable. Instead, a year and a half later, the investigation reported that the officers were acting in self-defense. And now the victim's family are forced to live in constant fear of retaliation from the deputies. His family now all wear body cams attached to their clothes everywhere they go. So this way, if they are also gunned down by police, then at least they have some footage of what actually happened to them. A year and a half after Anthony was killed, the LA District Attorney released an investigation into his death. It found that there were no fingerprints on the gun and DNA testing was inconclusive. The burglary victim said Anthony was not the person who stole his watch. Still, the report concluded that the deputies acted in self-defense. That's not what Anthony's family believes. Let me remind you that these are law-abiding citizens who pay taxes and those very same tax dollars are going directly into the pockets of the ones who are preying on them. The ones who took their family member's life and are still patrolling the streets of the communities in which they live. This shit is like a real life version of the Hunger Games. These deputies are being paid upwards of $250,000 a year to terrorize minorities. It's quite ironic because we were always taught that the red, white and blue represented the land of the free. The land of opportunity where you can be all that you can be. Obviously, that dream has always been a nightmare for those who don't share a pale skin complexion. I'm saying we are all familiar with the Bloods and the Crips, but how often do you hear folks mention the Wayside Whiteys or the Executioners? I'm sorry, but that's bullcrap. I'm not going to sit here and I'm not going to accept that. He knows there's a gang within his departments. He knows that he needs to do something about it. My son deserved better. He had aspirations. He wanted to be the next barbecue pit master, an amazing cook. Two, three. Oh. Growing up, his siblings used to pick on him because he was such a mama's boy. And as he became a preteen, he became a grandma's boy. He was very jolly, always helping. Now we're left here wondering how my son would have been. What they did to him was not fair. And what we believe is what done in darkness comes to light. Now, let me introduce you to one of the biggest dirtbags on the planet, ex-Sheriff Alex Villanueva. He was the leader of this dipshit deputy epidemic, but he was only a symptom of a much bigger issue. Because like I said before, this shit has been going on for over five decades. Which means the department won't investigate if a deputy's in one of these groups unless a crime has been committed. I don't make decisions based on perception. I need facts. Evidence that someone uses a gun unlawfully because of in furtherance of a gang, I have never ever seen that. The allegations have been there, been made there by plaintiff's attorneys because they get to add more zeros to the check when the county settles. You're telling me that somebody who lost a loved one, that their motive is purely financial? Well, if your loved one fought with the deputies, armed, and the deputies were able to overcome the resistance and they resorted to deadly force, at some point I have to say, time out. 
is it, just accept the facts and don't tarnish your organization because you just cannot accept that. This is more than merely an issue that needs to be discussed. This is an epidemic that needs to be completely wiped off the face of the planet. Also, I'd like to point out that the sheriff appears to be drunk in those interviews. I just don't understand how this happens. Who the fuck gave this shit-faced sheriff a job? He's literally slurring his words when giving interviews, and somehow somewhere someone said yeah. That guy should be the sheriff. It reminds me of an old NWA saying, fuck the police. More specifically, fuck that guy and every gang he bangs. No diddy. Now let's bring the clocks back to the current day and let's take a look at the progress that has been made. Because of all the recent pressure, the city of Los Angeles has been forced to start cleaning up this pile of garbage that they call a police department. Dozens of LA County Sheriff's deputies have been ordered to show their tattoos and be interviewed about alleged gang ties. The investigation by the Office of Inspector General comes after years of accusations of deputy gangs within the department. KTLA's Rachel Metatoff has more on the investigation and the consequences those deputies could face if they don't comply. Hi, good evening. Failing to cooperate with this investigation could impact the deputy's employment status. That's according to a letter sent to 35 LASD deputies. They've been asked to come in for an interview and to bring photos of any tattoos they have that might link them to one of two notorious deputy gangs. L.A. County Sheriff Robert Luna is ordering his deputies to submit to interviews with the Office of Inspector General related to deputy gang affiliation. He says deputy personnel are required to provide full, complete and truthful statements. So far, 35 deputies have received one of these letters. In it, the OIG writes that it's conducting witness interviews to establish membership in the banditos and executioners, which it says are exclusive, secretive, and may qualify as law enforcement gangs. Investigators ask the recipient to bring a photo of any tattoos that might resemble these images, and they'll be asked about its origin. In a world of go-getters and life-takers, Sometimes it's important to just clean out the system and start from scratch. Police gangs are absolutely unacceptable. Your communities look towards you to keep the order within their world, a world that you are sworn to protect and serve. Don't get me wrong, I understand this might be an extraordinary role to uphold and live up to. And obviously, this job is only for exceptional human beings. And extraordinary jobs require extraordinary people. So if your feet do not fit into those boots, then maybe you should reconsider your profession. Thanks for watching. This has been Alien for now.